All right, y'all, I'm back with part two because I'm going in on Wade. You know, because those of us that were born in the late or 50s, mid 50s and the late 50s, early 60s that are from the Midwest, meaning like Milwaukee, Gary, Chicago, East St. Louis, St. Louis, East Chicago, um, Detroit. Uh, we take a real of uh, Cincinnati. Cleveland, we take a very, um, we got a real strong love for Michael, and a lot of us take real offense, because we really feel like we grew up with Mike, because a lot of times when artists are in um, a circuit, depends on where they're from, especially in the Midwest, they travel a circuit, like well, I was telling y'all about Robert Kelly, so there's a few people that are really personal, and I, I take it real personal with Michael, who ends up being the son of the whole world who in, became the ambassador of the angel Michael, the archangel, that for him to go out and for me to, to not have anything to say about people that are trying to just rip his legacy to pure shreds, those of y'all who are jumping on that bandwagon, shame on you. Shame on you. And even if not so much that you, even if you believe it, even if you believe this stuff, the hypocrisy of it all. Where is your moral compass that can see an Oprah Winfrey try to uh, degrade and pour more oil and on and on fire of a dead man, but yet and still can have pictures snuggled all up with Harvey Weinstein kissing all over him? And if what people say about him is true. You had to have known it. You had to have known it. There's no way you didn't. And everybody know that you know. Oprah's another one from the Midwest who we tried to protect for a long time because she became such a huge star. But my foster sister, who's dead now, went to Fifth Street School with Oprah. She went to Fifth Street. Not, and in fact, they're the same age. I said, my sister just passed on like couple years ago. And what they had to say about Oprah was that she read a lot, which I thought was very positive, the part that she read a lot and stuff like that. But it was also noted by a lot of people that went there that she just seemed to be real stuck up and wanted to stick on the teachers all the time because she thought that talking and being with other black kids, even though she went to a black school, was like not what she wanted to do. So she was already carving out this persona about herself. What she was gravitating towards. And I'm not saying that there's, I don't know who put it in her head. Maybe seeing her granny work as a maid did it. I don't know. But I know from the time that she got to Nicolay, from the time that they bust her from, uh, uh, from the school she went to until she went out to Nicolay with the rich kids, like the Parches and Finlaysons and all the uh, rich African-American uh, people here. There's only, and there's only about three families, and they were all doctors. But the majority of people in that Fox, uh, what is it? Um, Fox Point School District are white. They, I've heard a lot of stories how how the old folks say, my grandmom and them used to say, farming up in people's ass. That's what they say about you, Oprah. I mean, I don't know. I, I wasn't there. So allegedly, you farmed up in, in people's butts and, and you didn't want to be around any black students at all because maybe you felt they had ruined your reputation. And so if they were exploiting you, then you probably felt a feel of needs. There's some kind of psychological damage to exploit somebody back, especially black male. Because you and um, I used to try to make excuses for you when I never seen you bring any black psychiatrists on as if no black men are good therapists. But you gave a show and a platform to Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz and Rachel Roy and God knows how many other people. Susie Orman, and all, but you never promoted no African-American people in their perspective careers. I couldn't make excuses for that. 
coming from Milwaukee. If you, you, there's nothing I can say. You see, I know how Milwaukee is. I know how it is now, and I know how it was then. And so you came out of this? Okay. Probably saved you when you went to Baltimore. To some degree. Because that's what propelled you to that other level. But what, oh, what, what Monique said about you is very profound. That you wouldn't deal with none of this stuff about Wade Robeson and you'd go straight to the throat of Michael Jackson, a dead man. Shall we continue? Another meeting, another lie. The second time Robeson met Jackson was two years later when he was seven and a half because he was born on September 17, 1982. The dance company he immediately joined after winning MJ competition at age of five was the J Johnny Young Talent Dance Group, with which he traveled all around Australia for the next two months. I mean, two years, I beg your pardon. In 1990, when he was seven, the dance group went to the U.S. to perform in Disneyland on Australia Day. The date on the Australian flag in this screenshot gives us the exact date of their only one performance there as January 26, 1990. And you can see it right here on the banner. Okay, I'm with it. Let me if I can screenshot that for y'all, but I don't know how to do all that fancy stuff. But I can tell you, I can direct you to this article. I can leave a link in the description and y'all can read it for yourself. After that, Joy Robson started calling around and only on February 1st or seven days later managed to contact Norma Stakos, who was Michael's administrator. Norma put the family in touch with her boss, Michael Jackson, and the next day he invited him to a recording studio where he was working at the time. The party attending the event included Wade Robinson and his parents, Joy and Dennis, his sister Chantel and his maternal grandparents, all of whom were on vacation in the U.S. The meeting at the recording studio took place on February 6, 1990. In her testimony at the trial in 2005, Joy Robeson said that in the studio they showed Michael the videotapes of Robeson's performance, which they cleverly took with them on the vacation now. Uh, Michael Jackson was impressed and invited them to Neverland, where the whole family spent the weekend. Now, Robeson doesn't remember any of those circumstances and is asking his mom questions. In this email dated September 12th, he wonders, how did we end up being able to meet Michael again at the record one that first trip? And what was the point? Um, and and at what point was that figured out and arranged? Before the U.S. trip or during? You have any idea what date um, was that of recording one meeting? This is all Wade. Can you tell me all that you remember about that first meeting at Record One? How did he end up inviting us to Neverland? How did that go down? Okay, y'all checking this out, right? This is what he's asking his mama. How did we end up inviting, Um, I mean, what was the driving arrangement when we all went to Neverland that first time? What did we sign when we first drove into Neverland? That first time with Michael Jackson and who signed what? What was the description of what the NDA said we could not disclose as far as what you remember? Well, actually, the last two questions smack more of the future lawsuit that would be filed eight months later in May of 2013. Indeed, what 
for what indeed what for would Robinson want to know whether they signed a non-disclosure agreement? NDA. I mean, and what po what points it contained if at the time he was writing this email, the only problem at stake seemed to be this so-called healing process. Right? Y'all get what I'm saying? <coughs> His mom answer is unavailable to us. But we know what she said about that meeting to the media back in 1991. At that time, she stressed that it was virtually impossible to get to Michael Jackson, but she still managed to get through her determination and her through her lot of luck. It was fate and a lot of luck that they saw each other again because Michael is virtually impossible to get a hold to. But we managed, said Joy. That's what his mom said. Okay. So in other words, it seemed like they was going real hard trying to get in touch with this normal person so they could get this one day because they was only going to be in there one day. Okay. And now look at the transformation. The above innocent piece was subjected in Robeson's complaint. Here, the gap between the fact and fiction is so glaring that it's almost unbelievable that he can lie that much. Like another Donald Trump. She says it was virtually impossible to get a hold to Michael, and he implies that it was easy as they simply contacted him the next day, not seven days later. She says it was false it was fate, I'm sorry, and much luck. And he says it was Norma Stakos who was a madam who procured Michael with uh, sexual abuse victims and arranging meetings for her boss. She says it was her effort, this is the mama, and claims that it was Michael's companies that purposely orchestrated it and... Um, I'm sorry, she says it was her effort. And her son claims that it was Michael's companies that purposely orchestrated and was grooming the parents that way. Okay? That is insane. This dude, ugh. after a couple of discoveries like that, don't you already know all you need to know about Robinson? And are you still sure you want to know more? Let's talk about his failing memory. If this was not enough for you to continue with Robinson's questions to his mom, then the thing they further make clear to us is that he doesn't remember anything, even their first memorable visit to Neverland in 1990. Can you explain all that you remember of the first night at Neverland? What happened when we drove in? What did we do? And that first weekend at Neverland, so he don't remember, he don't, he don't remember nothing. <laughs> in her testimony in 2005, Joy Robinson described their first night at Neverland. When they arrived, Michael was not yet there, and they were shown through the house by Mark Crudoy. When Michael appeared, they played around Neverland, and in the evening, all of them, including the grandparents, gathered in the suite assigned to Joy and Dennis Robeson and their children. They discussed and showed to Michael their son's stage costumes, which also they cleverly took with them on their vacation to the U.S. Um, they showed Michael their, his little stage costumes. Then the children, Wade, age 7, Chantel, age 10, implored their parents to let them stay in Michael's room. She testified about it. And my husband and I sort of looked at Michael and said, well, if that's okay with you. And he said, oh, absolutely. If they'd like to stay, that's fine. During his recent deposition, Robert didn't, Robeson didn't remember them pleading with their parents, though he himself wrote it down in his notes, evidently after consulting with his mom first. His notes are being presented now as part of his healing process. And they are so extensive that by January 2013, he had already turned it into a book, which his literary agent was actively promoting among the U.S. publishers several months before the lawsuit in May of 2013. What's also interesting 
is that despite all these writings and pleadings, um, I mean, um, despite all of these his writings, at his December 22, 16 deposition, Robinson memory failed him again. And now he didn't remember what he himself had written in those damn notes. Question. On the top of page 22, you wrote, in case time to go to bed, my sister and I asked if we could say, please, please stay with Michael. Michael said it was only okay with him if it's okay with your parents. Answer. I see that. Question. Do you remember writing that? Answer. I don't. We got amnesia now. However, despite Robles' massive memory loss, he seems to remember everything about his alleged abuse. His complaint claims that it started on in about the second night and describes it in filthy, filthy detail. 